Shabbat Shalom, everybody. We, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a season, and I just want to jump in before we, we start with the, uh, with the actual uh, reading that is required for us to read together today, the parasha points, and, and after we get into the message. And this is something that is difficult for us because, you know, when you grow up with a tradition all your life. Like, I remember that on Easter, we had a tradition in our home that was very different to the Easter traditions coming to the States. Like having a leg of ham, like a, uh, like a cooked ham in a table, to me was disgusting. Because ham was sliced, you got ham in a deli and you put it on a sandwich and you ate it with your scrambled eggs, and you ate it, or you put it on a, on a soup in chunks, but then to have an actual glazed ham on the table as a centerpiece, it was like, why do I have deli meat on the table and everybody's excited about it? Now talk about cu culture, right? Traditions that we get stuck onto, where like you, you just kinda, your brain has to kinda shift, and it took me a time, because one day I was introduced to Honey Bake Ham, the store. And I realized this is a bigger thing than what I thought. This is, this is serious. There's a, when there's a store that does nothing but sell that, you gotta understand, okay, there's something to this story that maybe, maybe I need to learn something about this tradition because, because my ignorance does not, does not make me then define that as wrong or incorrect. Am I making sense to you? Like, I would have been wrong in saying that having ham in the center table on an Easter Sunday, me saying that it was wrong, back, just because I come from a different culture, would have been wrong, right? Would have been completely like, Jimmy, who do you think you are? But I had to learn about the culture and the traditions that in America, people do. And in that process, I was open then to learn other traditions that I was blown away by. Like I never knew, I thought in my mind there was only one kind of hot dog, a New York hot dog. You talk to me about a Chicago style hot dog, I'd be like, you're crazy. Who wants to put, who wants to put a tomato and eat that on a sesame you know, bun? I mean, that, that's why you have a Big Mac. You know, you want sesame on your bun, you eat a Big Mac or you eat a quarter pounder, but you don't put in a, on a hot dog, you don't put poppy seeds on that thing. You know, to me, in my mind, those were things that I did not make sense. And I learned again that this is about learning and saying, ah, I didn't know that. My, my, the only style of pizza I grew up knowing, guess what? Brooklyn, New York style pizza. And I do say Brooklyn. Brooklyn, New York style pizza. That was the only pizza I knew. When I learned about Chicago style pizza, I thought somebody just went crazy. I thought it was a joke. Somebody just said, well, you know what, let's just go ahead and put the dough, put the cheese, and then drop a whole pint of sauce in it, and let's call it pizza. It's like, that's not how you make pizza. Anybody could be a pizza man. You know, for us, being a pizza person, you have to learn how to knead the dough, how to move it, how to spin it, how to make it nice and thin, all with your hands. That, anybody can make it. Throw the dough on the big tin, just make sure that it gets stuck to the tin, pour the cheese, put a gob of sauce and put it in the oven. Then sprinkle some Parmesan, boom, you got it. You got some Chicago style pizza. I know anybody that comes from Chicago is probably hating on me right now saying, well, that's not how it goes. Well, you tell me a different story. Maybe I have to learn. But I had to learn that there was different styles of things. That just because I grew up the way I grew up knowing things doesn't mean that I was always right and there is only my way of doing things. And saying that, this time would be the appropriate time for us to sing that song that's called, that says, that goes like, it's the, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Because truly, this is the season. This is the season that every God-fearing, Bible-believing person should be celebrating more than any other pagan holiday that we've welcomed into our churches. The idea that 
that we celebrate two major, well, three major events during this time. One, we remember that God takes care of us. And God tells us that you will do this forever. We're going to read this in a moment. That you will do this forever because you will remember that I am the one that takes care of you. That's the sole reason of this event. Like, oh my goodness, I think that's a good enough reason for us to say, wait a minute, did God just tell us to remember this always and to always do this so that we be mindful of it? Of course he did. The second reason is because it was around this very time, this very season, the, the, uh, the angels appeared before a group of shepherds that were tending to the temple sheep out in the huge field right at the edge of Bethlehem, near the temple of Jerusalem. And they're out there, and the, the Bible says in the book of Luke that the sky filled with angels, and they came and announced that there would be, there was a king, there was the shalom, the peace of men has come. And the sheep who were Levitical sheep, and if you understand the Bible from the perspective of temple structure, these Levitical shepherds were priests. Anytime you hear Levitical something, it, it's a part of a priesthood. Understand that. that was, we already studied that in the book of Leviticus when God said that everybody from the tribe of Levi would be basically brought in as a priest. So these Levitical shepherds that are taking care of the sheep that get slaughtered in, as a sacrifice unto God at the temple are the ones that actually come to see Jesus first. Not the scroungy looking shepherds that we have assumed that everybody thinks that they're seeing. It's not, it's not that. It's different. You can't see me? You can hear me? You can't see me. I could see me. Oh, that's right. Because uh, I understand why. Thank you. So, yeah, you can't see me because we're on the screen. Thank you so much for us for double checking on that. Um, people can't see me, and they're probably saying, we can't see Pastor Jimmy. It's because Pastor Jimmy is off script right now. But no worries. Now you see me. Perfect. All right, we'll go back to that screen. So... When we're looking at the scripture, the way that it tells us the story, these priests, these men that are the ones that actually are the first ones to see Jesus in, a, in, an, actual, in an actual setting that we in English call manger, but I'm going to show you in a moment that a manger was also known as, if a somebody was in it, it became a sukkah. If an animal was in it, it, became, it was a manger. And a manger was nothing other than some sort of temporary building that was built out, especially around the time of the winter, where the, some of the animals could come in to eat the dry hay, kept the hay dry because of the winter, because of the moisture. And so it was a temporary setting and they would put the hay in there and it basically was a, a way to preserve the hay for the animals. But according to a Bible dictionary, when travelers would pass by, when they were on their way somewhere and there was nowhere to stay, does that sound like a story that we know about? They have nowhere to stay they were told there's nothing here other than that over there, that manger over there. Why? And you would think, why would somebody stick a pregnant woman into a manger? In our minds, right, we would think, how, how cold-hearted could somebody be, right? Well, it's not was about cold-hearted. It was the fact that it was around the time of the celebration of tabernacles. It was not uncommon for people to be staying in temporary homes, especially if they were traveling on their way to Jerusalem. Now, we know that the characters of the story that we are talking about, that we know we got in the back of our mind, they were on their way to Bethlehem itself because of the census. But it was around this same period of time that we see that these temporary homes were built out. 
So the very scene that you and I see all the time with the main, you know, with what we know as the manger, which is a suka, right? That scene, we should have put it up now. This is where it goes out. This is where it goes up. Because this is the time where they, we remember the time that Jesus was spent there. So that's the second reason. And the third reason, which is the most amazing one, is what prophetically it signifies. Because remember, we believe in prophecy, right? We live with the hope of an eternity, don't we? Or else why are we... <laughs> we live with a hope of an eternity, because if not, this would be a very depressing life. Okay? But how do we understand eternity if we don't understand that what is going to be good about eternity and what's going to be a good about eternity is that the entire world will be now be reigned by Jesus himself according to the commandments of the Bible, according to the commandments of God, and Jesus will be king and every man shall see that he is king of this world. Not the way that men rule the world, but the way that Jesus was intended to rule the world. Now that is looking into the prophetic. So us that fear God, that, that have accepted the word of God as, as truth, must find reason to put up lights, to put up, you know, put, put up these three different species of, of reeds and plants around our house. I'm thinking, I don't know, I'm going to have to look and invest, honey, and plant at least three different species of trees in our backyard because I think that stealing from the neighbor's trees is bad. I don't think that's a good idea. I think we're going to, I'm going to start shopping around throughout the year and plant a tree so I don't feel as bad so that when it's time for me to cut a, le a branch out of my tree for my suka, I'm not stealing from my neighbor because the one does not justify the other, right? So then when we do these kind of things, we prepare in announcing what it is so that we have great food. We have some nice, tiny, so that you don't feel bad. You could actually, there are mini cupcakes, really scrumptious, really well made. And it's a time for you to cautiously um, just celebrate. It would be, you know, I, I say that in a lot of the traditions, now that I'm learning, just like I learned that that it was a common thing to have an Easter ham in the table with a family sitting around. Just like I learned that, I learned as well now, and, and, and this is you know, one of the fascinations, that a lot of the Christmas holidays that, that came upon in the last hundred years, because as you know, Christmas, the way we know it, did not really, never existed the way we know it. I mean, it only happened about a hundred years ago. Christmas was prohibited in Rhode Island, it was prohibited in New York. It was prohibited in the northern states. It was a prohibition. You didn't celebrate Christmas because Christmas meant debauchery. It was not until the Norman Rockwell season, and after Charles Dickens wrote uh, that book, uh, the story, um, that, that uh, story about, oh, what was it? The Christmas Carol, yeah. Which we, we kind of get a little bit confused because we read the Christmas Carol and, and we're wondering why does the Christmas Carol... How come there's no Jesus in there? Was there no Jesus? Charles Dickens not know Jesus? Or, you know, we get a little bit confused about some of these things that we read it, but we take it as a very classical Christmas story. Why? It's because what Christmas meant in the period. Christmas was not a celebration really about Jesus. Charles Dickens made a point to try to do something about this. If you know the story of Charles Dickens, he was actually poor and out. He was going bananas because he could not figure out what to write. And this was the story that he came up. And he got very well known for this story. He wrote many other books, but this is the story that was his hit. And then later, Norman Rockwell, if you know him as an artist, he began to paint and design these things. And he is the one who designed Santa Claus for who we know today as a giant elf. The contrary, right? The next thing you know, the Santa Claus that we know today has taken a hold of what Christmas meant. So we changed the meaning of Christmas from something of debauchery and pagan holiday, and we transformed it to make it more appealing and welcome it into our homes when the Puritans of this, that came to this country would not allow Christmas to be celebrated. And most of us that come from the holiness background, we see the Puritans as part of the fathers of our faith. 
I'm sure that many of our great grandparents of our faith within the Puritan movement that came here, coming, you know, going away from the tyranny and the opposition of a pagan uh, mindset from Europe, coming to a new world to establish a, a new way of life founded by the Word of God. If they were to hear that in our churches, in our holiness churches, that we've welcomed Christmas the way we have, they'd be rolling in their graves, wouldn't they? We completely crossed out the values of what was originally in the essence and the mindset of them. I say this because it's got, just like I learned and I'm learning now that this is a time to actually be festive. I don't know about you, but I have a great dinner planned for tomorrow. I don't know about you, but for the Sabbath meal, I can't wait because I have a Sabbath meal that is, I'm excited about it. I made special plans because this is a time to celebrate. And throughout the week, I took the day off on Sunday. I couldn't take Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off because because of Rose being sick, I took a lot of days off before, so I ran out of my days. But last year, I took the entire week off. That was vacation. Because it was a time for me to just hang out, chill out, and, and be happy and have a party. So I'm a little bit bummed out that I get to have to go to work. But you know what? But still, I'm going to engage and I'm going to make this a celebratory. I put tiki torches outside in my backyard yesterday. I put a, I put a nice umbrella in the back. And Rose and I are already um, trying to pray away the clouds of rain to not hover over us for too long. We need the rain. We can't pray the rain away. But at least for it not to sit too long so that we could get to enjoy the experience. That's what this time is. And I get it. Listen, I get it. For me, it was troublesome for me to figure out what would people put a piece of deli in front of their table and can't wait to eat it. Like for me, that took me the longest time to figure out. So if it's taking you the longest time to understand that this is the reason for the season, especially when God ordained it, when God said that you're to do this forever, it's going to take some time, but don't worry. What was good for me was the fact that in this case, I did not have to find a honey baked ham store to make me understand. All I had to do was look in the Bible, the Word of God, and the Word of God told me that I was wrong and that He was right. Ain't that amazing? Go figure that Jimmy could be wrong in front of God. If Jimmy could be wrong in front of God, you know what? Maybe some other people can also be wrong. And all we could pray for is that we could actually look to wisdom, not leaning on our own understanding, but actually to lean on the Word of God. Did Pastor Jimmy just throw some scripture in there? Of course he did. Because it's a time for us to grow. It's a time for us to allow ourselves to not be stuck in our own mindset, not be stuck in a ways just because this is how I've done it. Because I, for one, I could tell you that I have had to learn a lot of things. I've had to learn a lot of things. You know, um, the last time, you know, one of the things that I, I could tell you that many years ago when I was in church, I remember that, uh, you know, when, when you went to church, you had to go church, into church all dressed up. I knew people that would not go to church because they had no clothes to go to church, which is sad, and that's terrible to know that we created this impression. And, and don't get me wrong, I think that you don't show to, to church in the thong, right? You don't show up in church in a speedo. Um, but to make it feel like there's a requirement for you to be suited up, I thought there was always something wrong about it, you know? There was something a little bit strange. Then I come to Florida. And I come to Florida and I see people coming in their, their Hawaiian shirts. And of course, you don't have to admit, tell me twice. <laughs> I'm like, I'm in. I'm all about this, you know? Let's go Hawaiian shirts, shorts. You know, I mean, and if I have a good manicure, I don't think that coming in sandals will be a problem. But that's me because, because really this is not about showing up in a certain way dressed as long as I'm not a as long as I'm not doing something carnally, this is about honoring God. 
And so I think that all of us have an opportunity to learn so much and to grow in the Lord. But I wanted to just start that up because, because I don't want you to assume that, oh, today is just another Sabbath. I'm so glad Miss Bernie asked me, what was that about last night? And you know what? It's because, well, two reasons, and I'm going to say this on the camera, and I'm going to say this in front of everybody. For those of you that have known the story of what's going on in my personal life, you know that 2020 has been really, really a challenge, number one. I think that I've made it through so far, <laughs> walking and talking, and I think that is just a miracle. <laughs> Um, so on top of that, other things have happened that have weighed us in emotionally, spiritually, in a humongous way. And I think the tipping point was this last week, just, uh, visiting with, with a mentor of mine, pastor of mine that, you know, she's at hospice and, and I think that to me, that kind of like just rocked me full to the other end, um, reminding me that I'm only human. And so next thing I knew, I went from Yom Kippur can't wait for Sukkot to, oh, Sukkot is today. <laughs> That's, that was me yesterday, and it completely blanketed my mind because the plan was that we were supposed to actually have, if you don't remember last year, last year we had two services. We welcomed the the uh, Sukkot time, and we remember if you, we did it outside, if you remember that, and we had our service and all this good stuff the next day. This is the things that we do, that we done, but this year, you know, I just, uh, I was overwhelmed, and I'm going to be very fair. Um, I was a little bit carnal last night, and I, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to not do anything this weekend. I'm just going to call everybody and excuse myself and, you know, take two Tylenol PM and go to bed. <laughs> You know, and hope that when I wake up tomorrow, this all was just a bad dream. That's how I was. And, and immediately, um, of course, because, you know, when you read too much the Bible, <laughs> you immediately, it just bring, brings scripture to your mind. And I had to find strength where I did not have, because if I claim that all things are possible and, you know, through Christ who strengthens me, then why am I giving up, right? That's, so I had to preach to myself and uh, pick myself up and say, you know what, suck it up, buttercup. And uh, so I said, uh, I, to be fair to everybody, I'm not going to start sending messages to tell people tune in tonight because they didn't know. And I, that's why I went ahead and just put it out there. I was going to tell you today, if you did not catch it, you could catch it, you know, later. I did send the link so that I would not forget because I did not want to forget sending that link and confuse it with today's. So that if you did get a message about that, that's what the reason you got it. But I didn't send a pre-message like I normally do saying, hey, don't remember, don't forget this Friday, we have this meeting and that's why. So it was a, a lapse that I went through. It's a reminder again that I am human and it actually opened up to receive Sukkot in a greater way. You know why? Because what one of the purposes of Sukkot is to be reminded that no matter what we're going in through in life, that we are in his hands. That no matter how we feel, no matter how, how low we are, no matter how heartbroken we may be, no matter how dried out and wrung out we may feel, we're still in his hands. We, it doesn't take away the feeling, but we're still in his hands. I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say. I, I, guess, I, I guess in a way is, is knowing that you're ill, but you're already in the hospital. So it's like, you know, I'm already here, so I know I'm going to be taken care of even though I still feel rotten. I know that sounds a little bit kind of like, well, that, but you know what? Sometimes life is. Sometimes you're not going to just feel better. You, how can you feel better when somebody you love for, for so long dies? Just like that. How are you going to feel better when you're heartbroken because, because a dream that you had suddenly is shattered into pieces, not because of your own doing, but because somebody just was... I just don't want to say the word because I'm going to say it the wrong way, but you could add an explanative into that. Um, and, and you feel like somebody robbed you. Somebody pulled the rug from under your feet. Somebody stole the joy out of your life. And now you're finding yourself having to force yourself to grin 
and to smile. And when you do smile, you just want to cry because you're angry now because you're having to smile when you really feel like crying. I don't know, maybe I'm talking to somebody today. But many times we feel that way. And, and this is the time that God says, it's okay. It's okay for you to cry. It's okay for you to be mad. It's okay for you to be upset. Listen, sit. Sit in a sukkah. Remember that I took care of these people in the desert where there was nothing. There was no internet. There was no hospital. There was no doctors. There was no place to go. Not, there was not even water or a store to go buy food. But I provided. I gave to them. Oh, they were in the desert. And the desert heat is cruel, no matter who you are. But I provided a shade. And allowed them to still live life. And at night when the desert coolness came through, which would, desert can be, it's, it's the two opposites, so cold and so hot, and God would provide the warmth through the column of fire. When, when others plotted to rally against them, even if you remember the story of Balaam that was hired to bring a curse forth by the king of Moab, and he would come over. What did God do? Israel did not even know what was going on. And God was working way out there by a mountain where nobody could even see and knew he could even tell. And God was already working himself into it. And instead of curses, Balaam had no other choice than to proclaim blessings. And that's what God wants us to remember. That if you sit in your yard, you look at the plants, you look at the birdies, you look at the squirrel, you look at your cat and your dog, you look, at, you look at nature, you look at the sky, you look at the sun, and you get to say, wow, you know, in spite of everything, in spite of everything, God is still there. I may feel lost, but he's here. I may feel like I'm in the valley of death, but he's here. I mean, what better company? See, sometimes we, we miss on the opportunity of accepting that we are in great company and we get lost in the circumstances. You know? It's like going, back, going, to, going with your, your favorite date, whoever that person may be, your best friend, your, your lover, your child, doesn't matter who it is, you're going to have an experience in a moment and you show up to this movie and you sit down and that movie is the worst movie on the universe. It's like boring to death and now you're all upset because the movie is so terrible, but in the meantime, for two and a half hours, you're sitting next to the most special person in your life and you just wasted it because you were so consumed by how bad the movie was that you forget about the one that's next to you. How much more with God? These circumstances in this life, listen, I wish that there was a way that we could just pray it and Boy, <laughs> there are so many prayers that I would be lifting up. But see, that's not how this works. God is not a genie <laughs> that we could just conjure up whenever we want to, asking him for something. That's a, that's a terrible conception of him. God is not somebody that we could just ask and want from and want from all the time. No, that's not God. He's so much more. So, so during this time, I got to tell you, in between me going to work and how, I mean, having, I'm going to use the word having going to, to go to work and the time that I have spent, I'm going to do my best to just find joy and find delight. Whenever I'm drinking my cup of water or, or eating whatever meal I'm going to eat, I'm going to enjoy, I'm going to savor every single bit of it. And I'm going to give thanks to the Almighty for, a, for letting me learn how to cook because I don't have a wife that cooks. <laughs> I'm going to give, I'm going to proclaim glory to the Almighty because I have the know-how and I had to buy food to have with my wife. You know that even if all I had was tuna fish and bread and there's nothing wrong with that, then praise Elohim that we have bread and tuna fish to eat. That if we don't have a beautiful sukkah but we have a 
uh, an umbrella from Goodwill and a couple of tea torches outside and we made our little suka. You know what? My wife said yesterday, Jimmy, this is the best suka yet. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, my goodness, compared to what we've done other years, you got to be kidding me. Because you know that we've been all out. You know that this is, and I looked at it and I just felt so short. I did, I was shorthanding this so bad. And she came in and she was like, oh my goodness, this looks so awesome. Because she was able to fill with her eyes with the joy of God. She was able to see more than just the simplicity of it. Because truly, it was a bad movie, folks. <laughs> that suka out there is a bad movie. But guess what? She found joy in the company of who we will be in that suka with. So that bad movie turned into the best movie ever. And so I tell you today that you have a chance to look at this very time. Yes, put glitter, throw out your tinsel, put out, put out tinsel through your house, put out lights, you know, make this celebratory, make this nice, make this, you know, make this worthy of people asking, what are you doing? Why are you so happy? Because there's time for everything. There's time to cry, there's time for, for war, there's time for pestilence, there's time for for sickness, but there's also time for joy. And this is a time that God wanted us to set apart every year to be mindful that no matter how crappy our year could have been, yes, I did say that word, that we could actually at least carve a space of time. Outside of the weekly Sabbath, we could carve a space of time because let's, be, let's face it, sometimes Sabbath is not enough. Sometimes you're like so glad Sabbath is here and now you're crying because you're wishing that that sun doesn't come down. But see, this is the Sabbath of the feasts. This is the seventh mohedim, the seventh appointed time. So this is a time for us to just relax before the Lord and find joy in His presence. Amen? Let's say a word of prayer. I'm going to guide you through the scriptures because I have to do this. And I'm going to maybe just wrap the sermon today because I think that I think that we just needed to hear that probably. And I'm going to be wise. But we do have to read the scripture. This is something that we have to do. So we're going to read the scripture here. And amen. And just so if you, I appreciate your patience. Uh, this was not part of the notes that I had to share with you. And I promise that I will, I will share those in another time, or at least the, the rest of it. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you folks about it. But um, I want to just remind you that this week we do have Bible study at 730 on Thursday night. Okay, we do have Bible study. It's going to be online. So um, we, the Governor DeSantis made the announcement of uplifting a lot of the rules so I'm not jumping to the gun. I just want to make sure that we know we're exercising cautiously. A lot of you and myself, we're all high risk. So we're just being careful. So it, give it a few weeks and we begin to meet again in person. I'm excited to do that. Okay. And um, we get to do that together. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, uh, let me look where I am ubicated because I started going off here. Okay, great. And um, of course, out of all days, there we go. And let's see if we find ourselves where we need to be. Could not confirm the request. So sorry. Technology. When you have a one-man band that has to remember that he needs to change his Wi-Fi setting to remote control into, the, into it. I'm glad that I was able to sort that out. Come on, thank you. Now I go here, go here. We're live, folks. Just in case you were wondering, this is not edited. So we're going to go in here. Just bear with me. I appreciate everybody's patience. And... I 
and just just hang it tight. Okay, so today is going to be one of those days, isn't it? If this doesn't work, we'll just, um, I'll just work it from the back and we'll just read it together in a moment. Just want to see where everything is. Come on. So it's not working, so we're going to do this from back here. I apologize, folks. For some reason, it's not wanting to cooperate today, but we'll get it working. We're looking for our joy, right? <laughs> so uh, let's open up with a word of prayer um, to read the scripture as we pray together, and then we read from the portion today that is coming from the uh, book of Leviticus. Amen. Let us pray. Praise the one to whom our praise is due. Praise be the one to whom our praise is due now and forever. We praise you, eternal God, sovereign of the universe. You have called us to your service by giving us the instruction, your Torah. We praise you, O God, giver of the Torah. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, When an ox or sheep or goat is born, it shall remain seven days with its mother. And from the eighth day on it shall be acceptable as a food offering unto the Lord. But you shall not kill an ox or a sheep and her young in one day. And when you sacrifice a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord, you shall sacrifice it so that you may be accepted. It shall be eaten on the same day, and you shall leave none of it until morning, and I am the Lord. So you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. And you shall not profane my holy name, that I may be sanctified among the people of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. 
the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, that you shall proclaim as holy convocations that they are my appointed feasts. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do, not, do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. These are the appointed feast of the Lord, the holy convocations which you shall proclaim at the time appointed by them, for them. In the first month on the 14th day of the month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. But you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land and that I give you, and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priests. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And on a day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb a year old without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the grain offering with it shall be two tenths of an epoch and fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma, and the drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of him. And you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until the same day, until you have brought the offerings of your God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. You shall count seven full weeks from the day of the, of the, after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh, the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two tenths of an epoch. They shall be a fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven as first fruits of the Lord. And you shall present it with bread, with the bread, seven lambs a year old without blemish, and one bull from the herd and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offerings and their drink offerings, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And you shall offer one male goat for a sin offering and two male lambs a year old as a sacrifice of peace offering. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be the holy Lord to the, they shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall make a proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. It is a statute forever in all your dwelling places throughout your generations. And then you reap the harvest of your land, and you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. And you shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the, seventh, on the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it's a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does, does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generation in all your dwelling places. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves on the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening, from evening to evening shall you keep your Sabbath. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, 
speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month, and for seven days is the feast of booth to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, sacrifices, and drink offerings, each on its proper day. Besides the Lord's Sabbaths, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offerings, and besides all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day, you shall be a, it shall be a day of shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. And you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. And you shall dwell in Booth for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in Booth that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in Booth when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Thus Moses declared to the people of Israel the appointed feasts of the Lord. Let us pray. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of all existence, who has given us the instruction, your Torah of truth, and eternal life within us. Blessed are you, Lord, who gives us the instruction, your Torah, and we all say together, Amen. I wanted to read uh, two portions here. Uh, before we read this, I want us to say this word of prayer, but these portions are very key. I want you to take note of these portions so you could study them later. Um, Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has given us Messiah, Yeshua, and the commandments of the renewed covenant. Blessed are you, O Yahweh. Blessed are you, Yahweh, giver of the renewed covenant. Amen. This portion is from the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, verses 1 through 21. <clears throat> Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be delivered, divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives and that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the mount shall move northward and the other half southward. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. On that day there shall be no light, cold, or frost. <coughs> Excuse me. And there shall be a unique day which is known to the Lord, neither day or night, but an evening time there shall be light. On that day living water shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. And that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. The whole land shall be turned into, plain, into a plain from Geba to Rimmon, south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem shall remain aloft on its site from the gate of Benjamin to the place of the former gate to the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel to the king's winepress. And it shall be inhabited for there shall never again be a decree of utter destruction, and Jerusalem shall dwell in security. And this shall be the plague which the Lord will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are still standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongues will rot in their mouths. 
And on that day, a great panic from the Lord shall fall on them so that each will seize the hand of another and the hand of the one will be raised against the hand of the other. Even Judah will fight at Jerusalem and the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be collected, gold, silver, and garments in great abundances. And a plague like this plague shall fall on the horses, the mules, the camels, the donkeys, and whatever beast may be in those camps. Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of booths, or the feast of tabernacles. And if any of the families of the earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, there will be no rain on them. And if the family of Egypt does not go up and present themselves, then on them there shall be no rain. There shall be the plague with the which the Lord afflicts the nations that do not go up to keep the feast of tabernacles, the feast of booths. This shall be the punishment to Egypt and the punishment to all the nations that do not go up to keep the feast of booths. And on that day there shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord, and the pots in the house of the Lord shall be as the bowls before the altar. And every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holy to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and take them and boil the meat of the sacrifice in them. And there shall be no longer be a traitor in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. Now we're going to read from Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1 through 20. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, betrothed who, was, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for, in, for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people." And for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the, of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, shalom, amongst those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem to see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph at the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made it known that say, the saying that had been told them concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it was told to them. May the Lord always bless his holy word. Amen. Um, I want to... Oh, sorry. I want to point out a couple of things that, from what we read before we leave today. Uh, first of all, you know, in a portion from Leviticus, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward in understanding that um, the Almighty intentionally um, is saying that we're to do this celebration forever. 
and, and why we're doing it. We're doing it to be reminded of that, right? Uh, to be reminded that God is with us always. The second thing I want to point out from the book of Zechariah, if you are familiar a little bit with the scriptures, Zechariah is also known as a prophetic writer. When I talk about eschatology, especially Hebrew eschatology, even Western Christian eschatology, Zechariah, Brother Ray knows, is considered as that. And the portion that you listen today is actually for something that has yet happened. As far as you know, the Mount of Olives has not split. There has been no valley in between it, right? Nothing has leveled the way that Zechariah has seen it. Remember, this is something pre-first century that is seen a vision, right? So they're doing their best at explaining what they're seeing within the visions that God is giving them. So they could have seen a helicopter, for all they know is they'll see a circle within a circle, right? But we would know it as a helicopter because we see the, the, two, um, the two things that move around. Well, I'm not even sure how to call those. Rotors, thank you so much, Brother Ray. So the best way somebody can describe it is, you know, a wheel within a wheel. He doesn't, the word helicopter does not exist. So Zechariah, he did not have the vision of the helicopter, I'm saying, but I'm just saying Zechariah himself has seen some elements that are not yet happened. Number one, he's seen that the Lord, now when he's referring to the Lord, he's seen this imagery of this person personifying what it is to be Messiah. Remember that that attribute of Lord is to this greater being. So what he's seen is Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua, as king of the world. And those are his words there. Being crowned, being the rescuer. But it's interesting because Zechariah specifically talks about tabernacles. He mentions it outright. And he's talking about that tabernacles are going to be celebrated after after when the king is crowned and, the, and, and after the judgment and after those of us are in that millennial reign, during the millennial reign, it is a feast of boost. Now, he uses this term, those that are against Jerusalem. Did you notice that he didn't say those that are against Israel, those that are against Judah, those that are against Ephraim? He didn't say that. He said those that are against Jerusalem. Why? Because Jerusalem represents the epicenter of the faith. Jerusalem is the throne of God. I want you to make sure you understand this. When you read this in the scripture, God proclaimed Jerusalem to be his throne. Always remember that. This is not a man-made thing. This is God for having proclaimed it already, that Jerusalem is a place where he dwells. So Jerusalem is not just a temple building. Jerusalem is a holy city, which is why it's called a holy city. Okay? This is something that we don't really learn. We hear these terms off and we just kind of brush it off. But when you begin to listen to Zechariah and you begin to hear the words, those that warred against Jerusalem, what do you think he's trying to say? Those that warred against the institution of God, those that warred against what God represents on this earth, because Jerusalem is a representation of God on this earth. Okay? Now, everybody that opposes that will be destroyed. I'm not saying it. That's what Zechariah's vision says. So Zechariah's vision says that everybody, even those that are from Egypt. Now, here's interesting because Egypt was always an example of what is Babylon. Egypt and Babylon are parallels in the period, Brother Ray, right? In a sense that they all both represent carnality. They represent paganry. They represent debauchery. They represent everything that opposes God. They are the major institutions, probably... That's why later when John writes, John refers to Babylon and Rome almost within the same parallels because for the writer, for John, Johanan, this is probably almost 600 years after estimated time between John writing Revelation and Zechariah writing what he wrote. So we're seeing a very big gap of time. So what Zechariah is seeing for a... a um, uh, civilization that would oppose God, the major forces would have been Egypt and Babylon. Whereas for somebody like Johanan, the most recent ones for him would have been, you know, Babylon and Rome, right? It, just like for us, if we think about, if we, we think about fear within 
within the influence of an outside source if you grew up in the 50s and 60s, who was it? The Russians. But if you grew up in the 30s and 40s, who was it? The Germans. Right? So later on, now who is it? Now it's all about the Middle East, the Muslims. Russia still plays around, you know, in, in our thoughts because that generation is still with us. You know, there's always a Russian conspiracy. But right now it's about what? It's about the Middle East. It's about, you know, that's what we worried, this new generation. There's always been this oppressor. Let's just use that term, an oppressing society that goes against the values of God. And what Zechariah is seeing when he sees this vision, he's representing Egypt and everybody else as those that used to oppress God. But he says that everyone will come to a point to recognize Jesus as king of the world. Now, we know that through the prophecy of John, that every eye shall see, right? Every man shall know. But listen to what he says there. He says, those that don't come to Jerusalem, those that don't come to honor the Feast of Tabernacles, including those from Egypt. So he's including the, oppress the, the, the oppressors. Those that don't, that don't do it, I will hold back the rain. And what does rain represent? Rain represents the opportunity for you to live. Rain in the Middle Eastern mindset and the Near Eastern mindset is life. Rain is life. Rain is what will save your crop. Rain is what's going to fill um, your wells, okay? Rain is life. You don't have rain, you'll have no wheat to bake bread. You have no rain, you have no water to water your animals so you can have milk or meat. <laughs> you can live for 40 days without food, but you cannot live more than three to four days without any water. So when, when, when the vision is saying that, that I will hold back the rain, God is making a very strong point that even for those that are not part of the people and they're not honoring the commandment, the bad things will happen. Now, what I'm saying with this is this. God is making a very strong case for us to ignore and just simply take the Feast of Tabernacles as something, if I can do it, I do it. If I can't do it, I won't do it. There's a reason why it's there. That's why I always ask the question to myself, Jimmy, do you believe that the Word of God is the Bible? And if I do believe it, then it's there for a reason. And once I read it, how can I ignore it? It's like covering my eyes and saying that it ain't so. This room is not, doesn't have people in it. I'm all by myself. I'm all by myself just because I'm closing my eyes with my hands. And that makes no sense. The book of Luke explains the story, um, and I want to just show you quickly because I talked to you about the manger, and I just want to make sure that you leave with these details. I promise you I'm not going to preach, but I am going to show you these points here very quickly because they're important. And um, let me see if it comes up here. So in Enton's Bible Dictionary, I'm going to show this here to you. If, you are, if you're watching us, there you go. In Enton's Bible Dictionary, look what it says. E, uh, Easton's, sorry. Easton's Bible Dictionary. So the name given to the place where the infant redeemer was laid. This is the word manger, okay? This is how manger was seen. So it seems to have been a stall or a crib for feeding cattle. Stables and mangers in our modern sense were in ancient times unknown in the East. So the way that we know the manger, what it is, really in the time of Jesus really they didn't exist. We made that up. Okay? The word here properly denotes the ledge of protection in the end of a room used as a stall on which the hay or other food of the animals of travelers was placed. So it's like this temporary roofing that will be put on the side of a ledge, either of a stone formation, on the side of a mountain. Um, so it would lean, it would be a, what's known as a leaning structure, okay? It would be known as a leaning structure, and it would just basically be temporary. It would not be something for you to live forever, denoting the definition of sukkah. And then when somebody lived in it, or somebody lived in that temporary dwelling, 
it became the sukkah, or it became this sukkot, okay? Now, it's worth noting that just because, again, looking at the story, looking at the scripture, when you look at the writings of Luke, and you begin to connect all these points, it's hard not to see the immediate connection that we see to this. And uh, I just wanted to kind of at least leave you with this clear understanding of what we see. In wrapping up, Ecclesiastes was a scripture that I wanted to tee off and a little bit about the idea of tabernacles and our hope. But if you read it calmly throughout this week, which is we encourage you to do that, it's encouraged to throughout the week study the book of Ecclesiastes. Highlight some of those things. And we do it every year because guess what? Every year probably we need something new to learn. And some years we may need it more than others, you know, to hear what the writer says. And before you jump into this, I want to tell you this. The writer of Ecclesiastes does sound very doom and gloom, but what better time to read Ecclesiastes when you are nested in the comfort of experience Sukkot in the hands of the Almighty? If there is a time for us to look at the grim reality of our lives and be in a comfortable place as now, so that it helps make sense of things, not because it's going to fix things, because things need to be the way they are. They're not going to change, but it'll allow us to find this soberness that we need to deal with it so that we don't get ill through heartbreak. We don't get ill through depression. We don't get ill through anger or frustration, right? Because God does not want us to do that. He wants us to be able to maneuver and to handle and to deal with and to face these adversities that will not stop. They are not going to stop. Because today it's this and tomorrow we don't know what could it be. And so a um, couple of things, just consider that, that our existence in this planet is, is, is but a moment compared to eternity. It's about a moment, okay? Sometimes we, we lose our mind over this, and if we knew that just to honor God is what brings us to hope to serve Him forever later, that's going to be the key. Number two, to recognize that we have utter vanity in this short existence. I mean, we really want to look good when we grow old. My wife says that she wants to look as good as Bernie looks like when she has her age. She's like, I want to look like Miss Bernie when I grow old. You know, because she's like, Ms. Bernie makes her age look good. You know, and Ms. Bernie's going like, well, wait till you get here, girl. You're not going to feel it. <laughs> but it's interesting how we are vain, you know, in that way. We're already thinking and worrying about what is that we're going to look like later on or what things are going to happen or why I'm going to have or what will people say if I have or what will people say if I don't have. So we have to recognize that that exists in our lives. And, and sometimes the question is, why do we worry about that, right? The third one, you know, we could complain freely to God about the lack of purpose in our lives. We could complain freely about it, but the question is, God is not going to answer you something that he already gave you an answer. His purpose is already outlined. The question is, do you accept that as purpose? See, I grew up in a generation that wanted to know specifically what would be my title and what would be my pay grade. You know, you know God called you to be a pastor to nations. Okay, how big is the church? <laughs> you know, uh, oh, you're going to be a missionary traveling across the oceans. Okay, which ocean am I going to be traveling? Well, you know, like our mind was so stuck onto the wear and how good, uh, how, what kind of suit do I need? You know, what do I need to dress up for? I had people that would, would actually say that, that they had to prepare and learn how to look like in other countries because they were getting ready to go. And yet you would ask them simple questions about their, their life discipline with God and they would not know how to answer that. Because they were stuck on the idea of something because in their mind, they were not looking for purpose of God. They were looking for a sense of purpose within themselves because something else lacked. And they were looking after prophets or so-called prophets, words or visions that were not real. 
You can ask all you want about your purpose before the eyes of God, but let me just tell you, he's not going to answer anything he's already answered because it's already there. The fourth one, realize that knowing God gives meaning to even the smallest and most mundane moments. Every single thing matters. Every single thing that you, you see out there as you enjoy nature, don't be distracted. Watch, watch that leaf blade of grass move with the wind. Just watch it. Just see it how, look at its veins, how the food travels into it. Look at the tree, how it branches out. Look at the bird, how, how it just sits there with its beautiful plumage. Enjoy looking for the details in the smallest little things that God has done. And the last one, rejoice knowing God and live your life. Live your life. Don't live the life of someone else. Don't live the life of someone that you wish you had of the life of another person. This is the life that you own. The greatest thing that you could do to prove your character before the Almighty is to take what you have and make the best of it. The story of the rich man that gives the talents is so much more profound than what you can imagine. That he gives to every one of them, and even to the one he gives the least, he expects the least back. He expects something. He doesn't expect for you to say, well, here, here it's back. I couldn't do anything with it, so here you go. You didn't give me much, and because you're so demanding, I was afraid I was going to lose it, so here, I'm going to give it back to you. And he was angry. He was angry. Because he wants to turn a profit on everything he gives. And, the, and Jesus says in the parable that, that the rich man said, and because you knew that I reap from where I don't harvest because you knew that I take what doesn't belong to me. You still just give me back what I gave you. You should have at least put it in the bank so that it could accrue interest. This is Jesus talking. This is Jesus talking about the way that God demands from us. So he's reaffirming the idea that, yes, God expects something more than just us in our lives. So no matter what you find yourself blessed with or dressed with or bestowed with, whether if it's riches or fame, I tell you this, my friends, whether if it's nothing or little, whether you feel like your life has taken a change because of circumstances, finances, joblessness, a pandemic, bodily illness that was not expected, and you feel sometimes that you don't give enough to God. Listen, this is not about, this is not giving enough because we never can outgive God. This is about giving to God, period. This is about it. From what you do have, give the most to Him. Don't, don't cry because you can't give out of what you don't have. Because God does not want anything from what you don't have. He wants out of what you have. He wants you to give Onto him. Does that make sense? I appreciate your patience, folks. And again, uh, I'll promise that I will give you the sermon that was meant for today at another time. But let us go ahead and say a word of prayer as we are dismissed today. Almighty God, King of the universe, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your hand of protection. We thank you. We thank you because we realize that sometimes we could get so anxious, so anxious over things. And Lord, some of them are, they're, they're big deals. This is not to say that they're small. No, 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 no. But when we choose to look at you, when you, we choose to look at your greatness and your hand of glory, over our lives. 
God, it sure does make feel the worst situation a little bit better. It does definitely give us the reassurance that we need to move forward. That even though the pain doesn't go away, even the hole still feels like it's right there, even still, Lord, we're bleeding through our eyes and our hearts, even though we still feel broken and in pieces, to know that we are broken and in pieces in your hands is so helpful. So Lord, I pray that in this time, this season, the season of joy, the season of hope, the season of laughter, this season of remembering your greatness and being thankful for everything, Lord, I pray that every one of us, in spite of every circumstance that we are or may be dealing with, that, Lord, that we choose to find joy and delight in you during these days, just like you've command us, commanded us to. And I pray, God, that we continue to, to anchor ourselves to the wisdom of your word, Lord, that we lean not on our own understanding of things just because we were brought up or taught one way, but to realize that with both our eyes we could look at the Bible and see a truth that was not presented before us before. And that now we get to understand you even better and have even a better relationship than we ever thought we could have. I personally am so grateful because I thought, God, that I had the best relationship with you in the universe and realized that I was still so far away when I began to see deeply your word. I thank you for your grace and mercy. I thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you for Messiah, for Jesus, for having sent him, Lord. Thank you for, for allowing him, Lord, to, to just fulfill your purpose, dying for me and my place. Thank you, God. And we thank you for what's to come. We thank you for that time where we will have peace forever. I pray that your blessings be upon every person that is listening to my voice right now, that every blessing be upon them according to your word, according to your commandments. Let it be upon them. By the merits of Yeshua, we pray. And in your mighty name, O Hashem, we say together, Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Thank you for being with us. You know, I have birds, I have squirrels, I have cats, I've got, mm -hmm. got a snake running around. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got my own little, and i got all my plants out there on my back porch, so I have all kinds of things out there. <laughs>